One of the things that City Club has been trying to do more is, is to partner with uh, other organizations and in that stead, uh, we're really lucky and I'm really pleased to be able to introduce the Dean of the Crown Family School of Social Work, Policy and Practice, who's gonna be moderating this panel, um, uh, Dean Deborah Gorman-Smith. Um, and so with that, I will turn it over to uh, Dean Gorman-Smith and thank you so much for your attention. Good afternoon, everyone. Uh, as you've heard, I'm uh, Deborah Gorman Smith. I am very honored to be the Dean of the University of Chicago Crown Family School of Social Work Policy and Practice. And I'm really happy to welcome you all here today for this important discussion. This is one in a series of events co-hosted by the Crown Family School and the City Club of Chicago. Our goal in this discussions is to bring together civic leaders, academics, and community members for open and inclusive conversations so we can build a stronger and more vibrant Chicago. I wanna thank Jackie, Amanda, and the entire City Club team for their partnership around this series and for creating a space where we can engage in productive conversations about these critical social matters. I also wanna thank Adrian Talbot, our Associate Dean for Civic Engagement at the Crown Family School and the Director of our Office for Community Partnership and Impact for his work in forging this partnership and many others across the city and the state. Thank you, Adrian. At the Crown Family School, we're working to address pressing social challenges, including important issues of access to mental health and other social services and criminal justice reform. And today's topic on the ways we can improve our crisis response to support individuals with mental health and substance use issues is critically important with the potential to strengthen communities and address unmet social and health needs. We know that with the right mix of leadership, vision, and research, we can transform communities and, and entire cities. And success is possible when leaders, policymakers, and committed communities join hands to make systemic changes. I want to recognize and thank the many individuals who are here today in this room who are working to create models that, that we can adapt and successfully apply. And are the professionals who work every single day to, to de-escalate high-risk situations and provide mental health support and referrals. Today you'll have a chance to learn how policymakers, civic leaders, and researchers at universities like the University of Chicago are working to create safer communities while also supporting those members of our community who are confronting real crisis. We have much to share and to learn from one another. So thank you again for joining us today. And with that, I will hand the mic over to WBEZ criminal justice reporter um, uh, Shannon Hefferman, who will moderate today's conversation. Thank you. We have a really, is this on? Good. Uh, we have a really excellent panel of people here to talk to you today, but before we kick off, uh, Mayor Lori Lightfoot sent a video to just sort of set the table for what the work in Chicago has been over the last few years. So before we dig in, let's... Hello, everyone. I'm Chicago Mayor Lori Lightfoot, and I want to thank the City Club for hosting this important conversation on public health and public safety innovation. In October 2019, the Chicago Council for Mental Health Equity provided my administration with 33 recommendations for improving how the city interacts with people experiencing a behavioral health crisis. The following month, we accepted all 33 recommendations, including a request for the city to develop a 911 alternate response program. Over the last few years, my administration implemented the Crisis Assistance Response and Engagement Program, or CARE. CARE is the first 911 alternate response program in city and state history. 
The CARE program was developed in partnership with many stakeholders and with technical assistance from national experts to ensure we leverage emerging best practices and incorporated hyperlocal feedback. Today, our five CARE teams are serving 17 Chicago neighborhoods and have responded to over 700 mental health crises without use of force or arrest proving that these teams play a critical role in the future of Chicago's public health and public safety response systems. Care teams are comprised of mental health clinicians from the health department, community paramedics from the fire department, and some teams include a crisis intervention trained team officer from the police department. Together, these valuable and skilled employees have the tools and training to provide physical and emotional health assessments, address basic needs, and utilize trauma-informed de-escalation techniques where necessary. I want to thank these frontline workers for their service on our care teams. And as we head into summer, my administration has prepared plans to launch additional care teams on the southeast and far north sides of the city as well as a plan to integrate community violence interrupters and case managers into the city's crisis response protocols. My administration is also creating new transport destination options for residents experiencing a mental health crisis to ensure their needs are properly met, as well as linkage to community-based services offered by the Network of Trauma-Informed Centers of Care which reached a historic benchmark of serving over 73,000 Chicagoans in 2022. This month, my administration will release funding opportunities to establish a 24-7 sobering center, providing residents with a safe place to recover from substance intoxication and to get connected to services. We have been working hard with community stakeholders to establish a new stabilization housing program, which will create 40 units where unhoused residents with behavioral health conditions can receive temporary housing, on-site care, and other support services. Folks, I am very proud that my administration has laid the foundation for a more comprehensive first responder workforce in Chicago and that we have created new options to divert residents from the criminal justice system and into community care. This is just one more way that we will make our communities safer. So thank you one and all for all the support that you've given and thank you for this important conversation. So all that work you just heard described, a lot of that was connected to one of our panelists who's with us here today, Matt Richards. He's the Deputy Commissioner of Behavioral Health for Chicago. He oversees CDPH's community safety, mental health, substance abuse use, and recovery programs. And he's a licensed clinical social worker with 15 years of experience in healthcare. Um, we are also joined by Dr. Harold Pollack. Uh, Dr. Pollack is the Helen Ross Professor at the Crown Family School of Social Work, Policy, and Practice at the University of Chicago. Those titles are always so long. Uh, Co-founder of the University of Chicago Crime Lab and co-director of the University of Chicago Health Lab. His research focuses on improving services for individuals that are at the boundaries of behavioral health, criminal justice, and disabilities. He's also the guardian of an adult who lives with Fragile X Syndrome, and so he brings that lived experience to his work. Finally, we have with us Sheriff Jerry Clayton. He's currently serving in his fourth term as the Sheriff of Washtenaw County, Michigan. Uh, he has 33 years of criminal justice experience and he serves as co-chairman of Transform 911, a national initiative to improve 911 communication. Sheriff Clayton has received international recognition for his work in the criminal justice field, including represent, representing the United States at an international conference on law enforcement and bias-based policing in Geneva, Switzerland. So as you can tell, we have a lot of expertise on this panel today. And one thing I really appreciate about this panel is it cuts across all kinds of fields, which I think is essential when we're talking about mental health. Um, the title of this program today is 
how uh, do mental health crises show up in the emergency system? Yeah. And I'm going to start with a really basic question that may seem obvious, but I, I don't think it is. When we talk about mental health crisis, what are we actually talking about? What falls underneath that definition in terms of who's calling 911, who's showing up in clinics with emergencies? Um, and, and why don't we, we start off with, uh, with you, Matt? Yeah, that's a great question. So I think what we're typically talking about is when a person finds themselves in a state where their, their safety is compromised uh, related to a mental health condition that they might have or related to a substance use disorder or substance intoxication. Uh, that can lead to dysregulation. It can lead to changes in how you perceive reality. It can um, lead to changes in your desire to be on the planet, um, uh, dysregulation that you might feel towards other people. Um, and so in those moments, um, part of, I think, living in a civil society is we root our response in this sense of our shared humanity, that to be vulnerable is to be human. And in those moments, a civil society meets people in a way that honors the dignity of that person, um, that meets them with responses that respond to their suffering, um, uh, that increase safety, and try to get the person back to a point of stability uh, where they're able to communicate their wishes, they have autonomy, um, et cetera. Anything either of you would like to add to that? Not to that. OK. <laughs> Got it. Let me, add, let me add one thing, which is also that the crisis is also affects other people who it also uh, not only need, to, need our support, but who also know that they can call for help when someone is in crisis. If I have a loved one uh, and I'm concerned for my safety or that person's yeah. safety, people have to know that they can call because one of the crises that people experience is I'm, I'm dealing with this and I feel alone and afraid to call for resources right. because my loved one might get hurt or something yes. like that. And so part of the mission that all of us have is to make sure that all of the people affected by those crises know that they can get help safely, effectively, compassionately, in a way that respects the dignity of everyone involved. So it seems like there's wide agreement on that topic. You talk to people in uh, lots of policing spheres and health spheres. They agree that we need to do this differently. The old way of uh, arresting isn't going to work. If there's such wide agreement, why are we having such a challenge actually having that happen across the board? What's in our way right now? Why don't I start with you, Chef Clayton? Uh, I think history, right? Let's, let's just be honest. Uh, in this country, you know, racism and discrimination, uh, although we don't like to acknowledge it, is, is, is part of our history. And if we're talking about just from the police, I, I talk about police services less than just saying law enforcement. But in the police services space, we have 400 year history that shows northern policing, southern policing, and when you put that up against, especially the African American experience, there's no wonder as we talk about this, people wanna run to this space that we can address a person in need with a behavioral health disorder without the police. I get it. Uh, I, can, I tell people all the time, I view what I do through two lenses. I've been on this planet 58 years, I'm a black man with three black sons, mm -hmm. and I've been in this profession for 33. So I'll just, I'll say this, it's complicated we have to acknowledge the history, but we can't do it by running to our different corners and blaming each other for why we are where we are. We must decide and define what we're looking for, what the experience should be for someone with a behavioral health disorder and their family and the first responders. We should decide what that experience should be. And then we should decide that we can work collaboratively to get there. I am always worried, actually I'm scared, in communities that say we can accomplish what we say we want to accomplish, but we're gonna put the police on the shelf. That's an error. That's wrong, and I'm sorry. The places where we go and serve with people that look like me say, Sheriff, we don't want the police in the corner. We want dignity and respect when you engage us, but we know you're part of the solution. So I know I said a lot, but part of it is it's complicated. And our history is a part of it. And the history always gets in the way. First, because we don't want to acknowledge it, and then because we want to blame everybody else for it, and because we're not focused on what the solution should be. And that is a, a well and safe community. And we all working together can get there. So you brought up that we don't want to put police on the shelf. We don't want to uh, marginalize them in this conversation. Do you think, though, that police are showing up in times when they don't need to be the person showing up? That there, that there could be a wider tool set that we in the city have when someone calls 911? Yeah. Oh, without a doubt. So in Washington County, we talk of this, this continuum of community responders. 
Sometimes it's a police response. And if we think about it through the lens of risk and need, what's the risk that's presented for that person or for others in this situation? What's the need of that person? Physiological, psychological requirement for well-being. I think we look at it through that lens, there are times where it's a police response, a clinician response, a coordinated response, a co-response, but we have to discern what those circumstances are. Right. So yes, there is a time where there's a community situation, police don't need to be involved. It's not an issue. There's not a risk factor where we have to be involved. It's a need factor where we should be on the sidelines ready to provide support when right. it's needed. Right. You know, in, in Chicago, you know, what we've done with CARE, and I actually, if you're affiliated with the CARE program, do you mind standing up just so we can recognize you? Don't be shy. So, of course, everything we accomplish, we accomplish as a team. So I, I wanted to acknowledge that. Um, so we have teams that are a paramedic and a clinician. And then we have teams that are a paramedic, a clinician, and a CIT officer, right? So it's a hybrid model. Um, we have five teams right now. We'll have two more this summer. And the reason we decided to do to construct the pilot in that way is exactly for the reason that the sheriff mentioned, that we know, not only from Chicago, but from a bunch of other cities, there's a wide range of mental health and substance use emergencies in which the presence of a, a police officer is not indicated. And we know from the data that you can safely resolve those calls. Um, we also know that there is a pretty significant percentage of calls that come into 911 systems where there is a safety risk that's documented. That means presence of a weapon. It means the person has already put their hands on someone else or has threatened to harm someone else. Or there's a documented law enforcement issue, meaning there was retail theft, meaning there was trespassing, meaning it's suspicious person. And that's how it comes in. And in those situations, the choice you're left with is are you going with a police only response or can you integrate health professionals into that response safely because they are accompanied by a public safety professional? So there's no one model. I think what you're gonna see around the country is sometimes you'll have law enforcement only. Sometimes you'll have law enforcement led with health professional support. Sometimes you'll have health professional led with public safety support. Sometimes you'll have health professional only. But 911 was started in 1968, Shannon. It's 50 years old. It's in Chicago, it started in 1976. Systems have histories. They have deep ways of doing things. They have deep ways of thinking that get encoded in human beings. And so when you're thinking about a system and the system sends police or it sends fire, fire professionals, and now we're saying, well, what about homelessness? Well, what about mental health? Well, what about substance use? Well, you have to develop a workforce. You have to develop protocols. You have to train people. It's been an incredibly heavy lift, but it's a necessary lift because all of those things are emergencies. Mm -hmm. um, and we have not had a workforce that's commensurate to respond to all those different types of emergencies. And that's the moment that we're in. It's a moment of a lot of promise. By the way, could, I, I should say, I'm, as the gray-haired dude, I'm here representing. <laughs> but I wonder if my colleagues at the health lab could also stand up, and my Crown School colleagues who are also involved in the evaluation. So uh, I there, stand up. there they are. Because, because because I should say that, that that team has worked very, very closely with our partners uh, on, on, on matters profound and mundane to, to, help, yes. to help get this off the ground. And I'm, just, I'm here to represent. There's one thing that I think is really important, by the way, in what Matt just said, which is that 911 call is 30 seconds out of a two-hour movie of somebody's life. And, and there's a couple things about that. One is if the police in the 911 call it doesn't go perfect. Someone may have a cell phone video of that, or if the EMTs. There's no cell phone video of the fact that that person needed housing assistance and we were not able to help with that. There's no cell phone video of the family asking for help from a mental health system that is struggling to provide that. And one of the things that CARE is trying to do and a lot of the work that we're trying to do is, is to provide, not just to respond in the moment effectively, and this is true in, in Washtenaw County as well. Not just to respond in that moment, but to make sure that someone is connected to services that can help them. Uh, so, because very often you say, what happened two weeks later after that 911 call? All around the country, very often the answer is nothing until the next 911 sure. call. And so we have to think of this, somebody's life, the crisis is not that 30 seconds in that movie. It's, yeah. it's the entire trajectory that they're in that we have to be helpful for. That's right. That's a great point.
anymore. So, I mean, it gets to this idea that 911 emergencies, it can address that crisis, but you're going to have crisis after crisis after crisis right. if you don't have the larger system. So looking at our larger system in Chicago, mm -hmm. um, there's probably some things we do really well that we have under mm -hmm. control. Where are the gaps? Where are the areas where we don't have that long-term service mm -hmm. to hand a person over to who's in crisis that we need to do a better job at? I mean, in Chicago, you know, we get you know, over a million 911 calls a year, right? The sheer volume of human need that's expressed through 911 related to a bunch of different types of unmet needs. 911 is a dispatching service. It's not a case management service, right? It doesn't follow people longitudinally. We don't typically use 911 data to identify people proactively that are cycling through systems over and over again. As a social worker, when I see a person with the same need over and over again, my impulse is, okay, so how are we gonna help them address that need? Mm -hmm. Our systems aren't set up to do that. So things we're doing in Chicago now is we're actually really starting to look at our 911 data and look at people that are cyclically utilizing and saying, okay, how can we proactively identify those folks and connect them to the resources we think we need? The mayor mentioned the hotel acquisition. So that's a project that's based on work that folks, Barbara Otto and Harold and others in the room did, of looking at, we have 1,200 people in this city that cycle through jail, uh, homeless services system, emergency departments over and over and over again, right? Mm -hmm. $300 million spent on 1,200 people. Mm. And people, broadly, have physical health conditions, mental health conditions, substance use conditions, and are unsheltered. So what is the logical thing to do? The logical thing to do is to house people and treat people with dignity and integrate healthcare services on site. And we are in the process of standing that pilot up and what we're gonna be doing, Shannon, is looking at how does it affect cycling across systems, right? That's not something that 911 is set up to do, right? So we have to actually start creating systems and structures of care that we can help direct and divert people into to interrupt crisis after it occurs or before it occurs. Mm -hmm. Can I mention a couple other things? One is I think we have to deal with the issue of addiction stigma also. When we say mental health crisis, one of the things that's really striking, right now, if I walked out in the street right there and I started telling Jesus to fuck off and Jesus started arguing back at me, the police would actually be very compassionate. And the first response would be very compassionate, partly because it's a Wednesday at noontime, they're not super busy, but partly because I look exactly like someone who's presenting with stereotypical serious mental illness. Pardon me for using, I know none of you have heard that language before in Chicago. Um, uh, if, I, if I have alcohol on my breath, they're going to respond much differently. And, and, uh, and that is a real problem. Uh, and you know, when we think, for example, we do a really, there are models for team-based community care for people with serious mental illness, like assertive community treatment. We have to develop models when people have addiction challenges that are equally effective and that Medicaid pays for, and that we have a financing system that makes it sustainable. Uh, so that's, that's, I think that's, that's one really important uh, thing that I would mention. If we have enough time, I want to come back to that Medicaid mm -hmm. issue, because I know that's key. Mm -hmm. But um, you, you've all brought up this idea of uh, you know, there's addiction, there's housing, there's all these mm -hmm. things connected to mental health. Mm -hmm. So when someone calls that 911 number, or a police officer encounters someone mm -hmm. on a corner, how do you know when it's a mental health issue? How do we start defining that? Because it is broader than somebody who uh, is clearly in the midst of having a delusion, right? How do we do that? I'll start with you, Sheriff Clinton. So, of course, I won't go the clinical route, but I will start off with its behavior, right? It's the behaviors. And the police officer, the dispatcher, has to be trained. First, from a dispatch standpoint, when that call comes in, which... My commentary will be, if we're relying on dispatch from a societal standpoint, we've already failed, right? We, we have failed to meet people upstream to the point where now 911 is called, but that's just the commentary. But when it comes into 911, the dispatchers have to be trained to now listen for words, listen for how people, what they're saying, maybe the behavior of the caller if they're in crisis, or the family members who are now struggling with this person that's in crisis, to start to discern, okay, what's going on here, and who's the most appropriate responder for me to send to that scene? For the police officer, it's the same thing. We have to view people through this, a different lens. We always focus on behavior. The, the foundation of our reports is, is focused, pro, probable cause, reasonable suspicion, focus on behavior. But now if we've trained the police officer not to diagnose, but to assess what they see, and they have a fundamental baseline understanding 
of behavioral health issues, of substance use disorder, then they can say, okay, this is a person now that may be encountering a mental health dis uh, uh, crisis, a behavioral health disorder. My response now is it might be a little bit differently. So I, I, I'm, a, I'm a big fan of CIT. CIT in the way it's originally designed. And just say what that is for folks, the crisis, uh, crisis intervention training. But let me be really, really clear. In the purest design of CIT, they don't train every police officer in CIT. It's too cumbersome. But why wouldn't you train every police officer in the basics of mental health, responding to a behavioral health crisis? I equate it to SWAT. We have situations where we have SWAT, special weapons and all this stuff for special situations, but every police officer gets trained in the basics. Why wouldn't we do that in mental health? So we can't get dissuaded that I have a few folks on CIT and I have these units, because guess what? They're across town. This officer's on the scene right now and they need the basic understanding of what a mental health crisis is and how they should respond, create space, time, de-escalate, keywords, so they can uh, connect it to a clinician. So I think it's all of those things involved. And I think clinically, I put things in three buckets. You have people that are experiencing um, disruptions in how they perceive reality, right? So a lot of the time, the way that comes into 911 is it's a mental health disturbance. A third party sees somebody on the street, who they perceive to not be oriented to time, place, know who they are, et cetera. Another set of calls is suicide, attempt or threat. That's a whole nother group. Uh, a third set is related to what I call dysregulation, right? We all have a stress response system. It, it regulates our sense of safety in the world when it gets, when it gets thrown off, when it gets triggered. We are uh, likely, we, we escalate and frequently escalations are related to a dysregulated stress response system. So we get a lot of those calls too. We get calls, well-being checks. Um, my friend has bipolar disorder. Um, she hasn't been taking her medication. She's texting me, I can tell she's manic. Um, she's saying some really concerning things. Can you go check on her? We get lots of those, and my colleagues in the back who know more about it than I do can tell you about that. Right, so there's a wide diversity of types of presentations clinically of what comes into 911. Right, one interesting thing is those CIT principles actually are a really good way to deal with a lot of people, whether or not they have a mental mm -hmm. health you mean, Time, distance, cover, de-escalation, that's a great way to deal with many, many situations that don't involve someone with a diagnosed mental health or addiction disorder, but just as a way yeah, of de-escalating. That's right. So there's any number of reasons why somebody could be super agitated. You're never going to know why in that moment, but you can be a calming presence, keep that time, you know, give the time for that person to calm down or for other people to come and help. Keep that distance so that everybody's safe. You know, once you put your hands on someone, then you know, you've now changed that situation fundamentally. And so a lot of the CIT principles are just a great way for officers and, and others to interact, whatever the issue is. And it gets to that idea that we have this diagnosed mm -hmm. serious mental illness mm -hmm. that may show up, but like a lot of mental health mm -hmm. issues might be showing up. Someone just had a divorce mm -hmm. and they need That's to go right. back to their house to get their clothing right. and now there's a domestic mm -hmm. conflict. How do we intervene in that situation? Absolutely. Yeah. Yeah, and internally in, in police agencies, there's a paradigm shift. I, I remember when I started, we were taught, get in, get it resolved, so you can grab the next call. And especially in these times where everybody's short staff and the calls are higher, there's this tendency, because community will put this pressure on the chief or the sheriff or the commissioner, response time, get in and get it out. The paradigm shift is different. We're teaching it differently in the academy. Nope, slow it down, create space. Mm. No need to resolve it. We're now writing into our policy and actually training to, it's not just the sanctity of the first responder's life, it's the sanctity of everybody's life. Success for us is when we exit this situation, everybody is sound. That's right. Physically, socially, emotionally, psychologically, everything. So that's a shift in, in, in paradigm, which requires leadership in an organization that is now fundamentally changing the culture of a police department ultimately, hopefully, fundamentally changing the culture of policing overall. So we are seen more as a partner, mm -hmm. right, in this, in, in this space. Mm -hmm. If we think of 911 in some ways as an interface of how people turn to their government and say, yeah. I need help, right? Currently, most dispatchers, what they have mm -hmm. available to them would be police and fire, and fire including paramedics. What other tools would you like to see us continue to build out? If we think about like what, what are people actually turning to 911 for 
and how well does that match our toolbox? So, I mean, I think some of the core buckets are, so we're talking about mental health and substance use today, what some people call behavioral health, and CARE is our program in Chicago that's attempting to account for those types of emergencies. Homelessness is a whole nother class of emergencies. And we need to get in the mindset of thinking about homelessness as a crisis. Mm -hmm. It is a crisis when someone is homeless. Um, and we become so acculturated to it, we don't think about it that way. There's a lot of overlap between unsheltered homelessness and behavioral health conditions. Two thirds of people who sleep outside uh, have a behavioral health condition. Substance use disorder, untreated serious mental illness, or both. So there's a lot of overlap there. Then you get into violence. You get into DV, intimate partner violence. Lots of people don't call 911 for DV, IPV, because they don't want a primarily police response. So I think cities need to start thinking about, but those are dangerous calls. So, the most, or they in can some cases, be. the most dangerous. So, right, and so that's an area where I'm personally, I'm speaking for Matt Richards, not the city mm -hmm. of Chicago. Uh, <laughs> I gotta qualify that. I'm very interested in co-responder type models for IPV, DV. I think we have to start looking at that. I think um, violence interrupters, uh, when you have violent incidents uh, 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 where people are directly impacted by violence, people need trauma-informed support. Uh, whether it's a fatal or a non-fatal incident that you journey with the family around. That's not really, I mean, detectives do investigative work, but I'm talking about journeying with people. Uh, that's a whole different workforce. So there's a huge amount of diversification in training and that has to happen within the workforce as we move forward. You know, one interesting thing is this sort of a bunch of tracks that we need to be working on. One track is we need, we need systems to assist people who are not housed. We need systemic uh, improvements like in Medicaid. We also need to respect the mundane granular realities of the 911 system and emergency response and how different agencies can work together. So you're doing a co-responder model. How do we make this work? You know, when I think about my colleagues, Jason Lerner and Arissa Rowano and Rebecca Neustadter and the work that they do leading, leading our, our, our work in the lab, some of the stuff that, that they are really expert in is so mundane. It's like these people take lunch hour at different times, you know, the, right. the police and the fire, whatever. Or, or you, know, there's, you know, there's no overtime in this particular intervention or whatever it is. Mm -hmm. and, and respecting, I like to say giving the mundane its due, that, that we have to be thinking at a big systems level, how do we get people signed up for Smart 911? How do we, all these other things. But also, how do we do the blocking and tackling well and really respect the craft of public management to do that? Because I think a lot of this alternate response is, is just very intricate. Well, and very fractured, right? Yeah. Like we have, the county has some expertise, the mm -hmm. state has mm -hmm. some expertise. You have these smaller nonprofits that are now doing, or, or large nonprofits doing crisis teams. Mm -hmm. And it's, it's a bureaucratic thing, but like, how do we get these people talking better to each other so the resources are uh, deployed well? How do, how do you manage that in, in your county? So when y'all figure that out, let's just go to the corner. <laughs> Put the business model together, we'll be rich, I promise you. Um, I'm, I'm not sure. I, so let's just step outside of, of, of Chicago, and, and I'll give you from a county perspective. Um, we do have these different entities, right? So I'm the county sheriff, we're full service, we do police, we do dispatch, but there are all these jurisdictions inside. So as we're, you know, we're doing our co-response pilot right now, one little unit, we, I want it to be a metro, but I'm thinking, when I go into the city of Ann Arbor and we want to do co-response and they're talking about we don't want anything to do with the police, how do we do that, mm -hmm. right? How do we get all the elected officials lined up with a single focus on this is our mission and this is the strategy we want to put in place? The other thing I would say too, the challenge around all this is, it has to be the elected and appointed officials, the people who make the financial decisions. This has got to be 24-7, 365. Like I said, we'll step outside of Chicago because I'm not sure how that's constructed. But in our, we want this continual, but there are certain components that only work in banker's hours, nine to five, Monday through Friday. Right. Like the crisis doesn't occur on a Saturday <laughs> or a Sunday night or at night, where we know it does because we've been doing the study. So the elected officials have to commit to, if we're going to do this and build out this continual, Mm -hmm. and try to fill in the gaps, that's going to take a lot of financial uh, investment. And, and one word of advice, you can't take the 10% from the police and then you're going to fund everything else, especially in mm -hmm. communities that has been a disinvestment for 50 years. So that's a, that's a, that's a, that's a, that's a red herring, right? That's, a, that's the, the, the okey-doke, that we're going to take a little bit here and we're going to solve all our problems. 
Because when you take a little bit here in police, I don't know about most, but you know what goes first? Training. And we said we need to train the police more. So all of that, I think, fits in. I have no idea if I answered your question. But it, <laughs> no. well, I think you pointed to the challenge there, right? Which is, um, when we talk about this, by talking about mental health, we're talking in some ways about everything, yeah. right? And so we've treated police, in many ways, as the solution to all our problems. So if you want to take the weight off policing, it can't just be like one thing we turn to. It's going to be dozens of things we turn to. But then how do you get those things talking to each other so you're sending the right people, connecting to the right things? Which, which we, uh, to, to pull this yeah. off in a fraction, like 911, yeah. right? We now have 988 and 311 and these other numbers. How do we even coordinate on that basic Well, Well, I mean, that's a new opportunity. I like to think of it as an opportunity. So my, my colleague, Deputy Mayor Jay Stapleton, led on the 211 implementation for the city. So if you don't know 211 in partnership with United Way and many probably people in the room, mm -hmm. it is basically 311 for human and social services, right? So city services is 311, 211 is health insurance enrollment. I need a primary care doctor. I haven't seen an OB. My child needs to see a psychiatrist, right? You can call 211. But now that we have 211, 911, 988, we have a air traffic control problem, right? That's what it is. And so the question is gonna be, who is air traffic control? And what the systems are gonna to need to start learning how to do is they're gonna to need to start learning how to flag a call and say, you know what, this is actually better for someone else, right? Not assuming right from the outset that the caller has called the right number. Um, we need to do really good public education around it. When you're in crisis, right, in my world, when people are in crisis, frequently it is difficult to verbalize what one needs. It is difficult to know what to do. We don't want people to get confused and have to have some cue card of like what number they call. Yeah. So we're gonna have to do a really good job educating the public about that public awareness. And then we're gonna have to do a really good job of starting to redirect calls. And that's something, if you're familiar in Illinois with CESA, which is legislation that basically, and Lori Jones and other people are leading on that, um, that creates a set of guidelines in each EMS region for identifying basically some of the calls that might be more appropriate for 988. So let's say I call 911 and I say, um, you know, I um, am feeling suicidal, but I'm not going to do anything. I'm not going to hurt myself. I just really need to see a doctor. I need to talk to somebody. Maybe that the 911 system decides, you know what, we're going to send you to 988. And if they decide that you need, an emer you need to be taken to the hospital, We'll, we'll send it back to 911. And, and what are our current, is my understanding correct, the current capabilities, that's a goal, but we have not reached it in the city? Right, so, I, yeah, 988 redirection from 911, we don't have those guidelines yet. I expect them to come this year. Um, <laughs> looking at my friend, Lori Jones. Um, uh, I think they will be coming this year. Um, and so then 911 call systems will get trained on those guidelines. Call takers and dispatchers mm -hmm. will, get, will get trained on them. By the way, two things about that. One is, I. I think it's a big implementation challenge, and there's going to be successes, there's going to be glitches. And I think one of the things we have to do as a, as a society is be, is, is be appreciative. Yeah, there's going to be some gaps in this, yeah. and there's going to be some mistakes, because there always are. Uh, I will say there's one big cause for optimism in this, which is, yeah, I've been quite involved in the politics of health reform for a long time. I would say the two issues, you know, we're a very polarized time where so many things are just disfigured by partisanship in America, and I would say the two issues that are the least disfigured by partisanship would be the opioid crisis and mental health. Mm -hmm. And everybody from Bernie Sanders to Donald Trump, everybody understands, you know, we have to do a better job with this, and everybody's human. And, and it is really, uh, if, you, if you look at things like the NIDA Heal initiative around opioids, really everybody in the room across the political spectrum is trying to figure out how we do this. Now it's really hard, it doesn't mean we've been successful at it, but there is an atmosphere of pragmatism and goodwill that at least potentially we can build on, which we don't see in a lot of other areas of public policy, you know, where we really are so divided, particularly in the post-George Floyd, Donald Trump era, you know, we're just where we are right now as a country. I have like two Sorry. dozen more questions. Oh, I, would I could talk to you all all day, but I want to make sure I allow some time for people Great. in the room to ask questions. Mm -hmm. but let me let me just put one last one in. Yeah. Um, we are about to have a new mayor in the yeah. city of Chicago, uh, Brandon Johnson, yeah. who has talked really frankly about the importance of mental health in this city. Um, he's uh, talked about a support for treatment, not trauma, which would transform many of the ways we approach it in Chicago. Mm -hmm. 
as he comes into office, what's one piece of advice you all would offer to him uh, for how he thinks and wrestles with these issues? I would say two things. We've made a huge amount of progress over the last four years. It's not a small thing that probably this summer our team will have gotten to 1,000 calls, um, these alternate response teams. Um, so I think it's continuing to invest in alternate response. It's continuing to invest in alternate destinations. Mo many folks don't need to go to the emergency department. We need to have new sets of, of places to send people. And, and so I, I would say continue the investment, continue the strategy. Every administration has changes they want to make. Mayor Lightfoot's been an incredible champion, and I will be always grateful to her. Um, and I look forward to working with the new team. And I, I think they've said a lot of things that, that they want to continue to make these investments. And I think working with city, county, and state. We cannot work in silos. We, we have to leverage all the funding that we have. Mm -hmm. We're fortunate. We live in a place where our mayor, our board president, and our governor are totally in on this. They're totally committed. And so we have to you know, uh, organize our resources to continue to make investments in safety net and all health services. I just I certainly identify with everything there. I would say a couple of things. One is continue to learn. So we've got this care pilot. We're going to learn uh, things that are going well and going poorly and, and be pragmatic about it. I think creating sustainable funding structures is so important. I agree with you that having, having city, county, state aligned, uh, the way that you create institutional change in terms of the healthcare sector is you create stable funding that people know is going to be there for a long time. Yep, that's right. A, 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 a five-year grant is fantastic, doesn't create institutional change. Mm -hmm. University of Chicago is not going to say, we're <clears> going to set up a whole new service to, to care for people in this domain because there's a three-year grant. Right. That's, just not, that's just not the way the world works. So finding ways to get Medicaid involved and other funders in a permanent way is, is essential uh, in that. And uh, so, so I'll, I'll stop there. I don't live in Chicago, so you probably don't care what I have to say. <laughs> um, but as one elected official to another, I would say this, you're only for, for promised four years. <laughs> so whatever we call leadership direction you put in place, do it with that in mind so it's realistic. <laughs> and if you have a longer term plan for the next four years, you know, that's incremental. But you're only promised four. Think about a strategy that positions you to execute and, and, and make the impact within that four. Okay, so let's turn to our audience for questions. If you have a question, raise your hand. Someone will come uh, around for you. Um, and while that's happening, I'm just going to throw out a question that was pre-submitted um, from Paul Alt from the Alt Architecture and Research yeah, I Associations. And I love this question. How does the physical environment play a role in healing traumas? And I'm just going to I'm going to take broaden that in, in mental health in general in the city and how we approach it. I know, I know Paul a little bit, and he's, he's been in my ear about this issue, and I love that question. So, I, you know, we think about mental health in very disembodied ways, right? We forget that we are creatures that, that exist in environments, and our health is so bound up with the environment. So, you know, one of, my, one of the things we've started to talk a lot about under Mayor Lightfoot, and I, I, I certainly hope uh, Mayor Elect Johnson, I, 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 if I have a chance, I'm going to try to convince him we should keep doing it, is... There's, there was a big vacant lot intervention done in Philadelphia uh, by uh, an ER physician. And what she found, I will, I'll, uh, if you want to uh, read the paper, you can email me. Um, but basically, she found that greening vacant lots in, in neighborhoods where there were many, many distressed vacant lots had the mental health equivalent at the community level of any clinical intervention that we have. <laughs> it, and it sounds so obvious and intuitive in a way. And yet when we think about mental health, we think about medication, we think about psychotherapy. We don't think about these basic things, like the basic needs as human beings we have to live in an environment where we feel safe, that's stimulating to our senses, light, that's a basic thing, light, movement. So whether you're talking about the design of interior spaces, like um, that serve people with untreated serious mental illness, that are tra trauma-informed design principles, that's a really important conversation. But the other thing is access to green space in neighborhoods. Physical exercise, right? Um, uh, it brings down the temperature. What I just mentioned in terms of the way it stimulates our senses, all of that improves mental health. So I think Paul's question is a good one. Urban planners are some of the most progressive mental health people in any city. Uh, they already think like this. Clinical people need to catch up. 
Um, and a question from Jillian E. from Girls on the Run. Another, these are great questions. I love this question. Um, as we explore mental health providers responding to emergency situations, how are we thinking about creating systems that allow people to maintain their humanity and freedom in the situation and not replicate the same harms that show up in policing? So I'm imagining here if you, you, anybody could show up with disrespect or anybody could show up in a situation that removes someone's autonomy in a way where they're going to stop using the service. So how do we make sure we don't replicate that as we bring social workers and health providers more onto the scene? I'll, I'll start with so you, Dr. Pollack. I would say one of the things is that I think that the 911 system first responders need to work in partnership with the people who are on the front lines providing uh, pr people who run homeless shelters, people who run uh, uh, group homes, SILAs, people who provide services to people with a variety of challenges and say, let's work together and figure out how to do this. So let's, let's, let's make sure you're registered with a smart 911 system if you're a SILA so that when the first responders show up, they know, oh, this person lives with autism or this person is deaf. And just explain what, what Smart 911 is. Smart 911 is, is, is a way that you can, you can register, you can provide information ahead of time to the 911 system that says, my son lives with autism, and please don't show up with the, with the, with the siren blaring because that's going to make him more dysregulated. Right. Or we speak Vietnamese uh, so, that when, so when someone calls 911, the 911 call taker, who may know that it's not English but may not recognize it's Vietnamese, can say, oh, I've got to get somebody with Vietnamese proficiency to talk to this person. And I think working with the frontline mental health professionals, disability service professionals, uh, in places where there's predictable issues that can come up is, means that nobody has to walk into a situation completely blind. I don't know, I don't know people like staff at the bus station and places where, where people are going to be sleeping who are unhoused and that sort of thing. We're running thin on time, but if, does anybody have any last questions they want to pass up here? All right, we, did, we solved it. <laughs> solved in the city, mental health, good to go. Love it. Shannon and, and, and our panelists, thank you so much. Please join me in giving them another round of applause. As, as we were talking, what an amazingly important conversation. And again, we want to thank the uh, Crown Family School uh, and Deans Adrian Talbot, as well as Deans uh, Deborah Gorman-Smith for their partnership with the City Club of Chicago in making panels like this possible, um, as well as all of the other panelists and folks here today. This is something we plan to continue. Obviously, we have a lot of work to do. We are not done. I know it's something I care a lot about. Our uh, chairperson um, is, is actually uh, being honored tonight by the Chicago Children's Advocacy Center as our luminary, Jackie Robinson Ivy. Uh, she's an amazing woman and friend and uh, has, is on the front lines of making difference uh, relative to mental health care response. Um, I'm our fundraising chair for that group, so ho hopefully you, you, you join us uh, for our dinner tonight. Uh, if, and if you need a seat, stop by and ask me later. Um, and with that, um, I also wanted to uh, thank all of our panelists, uh, and, and I'm pleased to offer you uh, your one-year mem complimentary membership to the City Club of Chicago. I'll have certificates, and we'll get photos right at the close of this program. Um, and with that, folks, we are adjourned. Thank you so much for joining us, and I very much look forward to seeing you all again.